Mike Altieri is someone who you know, even if you don't think you know, because whenever you consume anything LA Kings related, he has played a part in getting it out there. And now we're going to tell his story and get that out there. Mike, of course, is Senior Vice President, Marketing Communications with the LA Kings. And he joins me on the On to Something podcast. I'm Brian Fenley with Tennis Channel and Fox Sports Radio. This is a chance to look at Mike's life beyond. Obviously, we'll talk about his career, but as a dad as well, we're going to get the full picture here, Mike. And I'm excited to have you on. Well, I, I appreciate it, Brian. I'm uh I'm thrilled to, to be here, and uh, thank you for having interest in speaking with me. That, uh, that means a lot. I've known you a long time, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. This will be really worthwhile, and I, and I promise you're going to have a lot of fun. So I see over your left shoulder a, a little replica of the Stanley Cup, and obviously with you being alongside the Kings for all these years, you've enjoyed a Stanley Cup or two. So my first question is, what's the difference in the love you have for the Stanley Cup and the love you have for your immediate family. Oh, it's a massive difference. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the love I have for the Stanley Cup goes back to, you know, the day I started working for the LA Kings back in 1995, um, just as a professional goal and something I was driven to hopefully experience, but also knowing that uh, the ability to experience that had really nothing to do with my contributions, uh, just the hope that I could be a part of something like that was something that lingered with me for a long time. And it was, I think, 17 years until I had the opportunity to to go through that. So for 17 long years, I was like, wow, am I ever even going to get close to this? And um, fortunate that it happened twice, uh, which was a thrill for sure. But comparing that to family and uh, is there's no comparison. My my wife and my son are uh, the ultimate priority for me. Um, there's nothing I want more than to be with those two as much as I possibly can. Um, and we're empty nesting right now, my wife and I. So just having my son uh, living away from our our home and and that safe haven that we've always had together, the three of us, has been a unique experience, but but a good one. What is that dynamic like, knowing that you're proud of your son, Gabe, and what he's doing, but that you only get to see him when he's back from school? Yeah, it's. Uh, it, it, I would say it's challenging, but it's not. I mean, my wife and I are both our own individuals, and, um, you know, when he's with us, it is you're the ultimate parent. Like, you're you're just trying to uh, nurture and and provide the whole time he's there. Um, but at the same time, you sacrifice so much because that is your primary focus. And so with him being gone, which was a difficult thing to go and drop him at school and knowing he's going to be living on campus, um, we knew it was what he needed to grow and mature. Our job as parents are basically done. Um, <laughs> he, you know, We weren't going to influence really anything further um, and it was all about life taking over and teaching him and helping him mature. And so we knew that's something that had to happen for him. So, and then for us, it took away that daily responsibility of parenting and nurturing and, oh, we have lives too. We can, we can do what we want to do. And, uh, so we're enjoying that. And now, you know, my job takes me away quite a bit not just travel wise but just um from a commitment standpoint so um she has her own career as well and we just kind of meet up when we meet up and when we're together we're best friends as always and when we're not we're out going after things and pursuing things you, you talk about your wife and if i'm not mistaken mike you've been with her for 26 years i saw a recent yeah. post a year ago you said 25 years so doing the doing the math and you said you began that journey together with no idea what was ahead, of, but that you that you knew that in ways in which you were different, but at the same time you were intertwined. To go back and to think how much you two have have grown and matured together, how do you put that into words? The the, the team you talk about the team you work yeah. with with the Kings, but the team that you have at home, and how mm -hmm. that's grown. I appreciate that, and I appreciate those comments, and because that is truly so meaningful to me. Um, I, I, I guess when I look at my wife just celebrated her 60th birthday back in October and we threw a big party for her and I had to make a speech and, and within that speech, one of the things I talked about was, 
you know, you go into a partnership and a marriage and, you know, you kind of approach it as a 50, 50 thing. Like we, we both have to give the same amount. And then there's some times where, you know what, I got to give 70 this time, or I got to give 80. And, um, you know, knowing that you may not get it back on the other end, you just, you do it and you, you, you sacrifice for that partner. Well, it's like, I feel like my wife's always at a hundred and she puts me first and our son first constantly. And, that's what she's taught me um, through this whole journey. Um, she knew I was embarking on a career I was very passionate about and was going to take me away from the family at times due to travel and, and all of that. And all she did was support and sacrifice and always put me first. And she taught me that. And I have in turn, uh, I hope, um, delivered the same back to her, especially once I figured out that was the recipe for success and so we're always sacrificing for the other one um and our, our partnership and relationship has just gotten stronger and stronger so you know a lot of people i think struggle when children move out and then it's just them too and they're like oh we don't really know each other and i think it's completely the opposite with me and my wife we've we've been fully engaged throughout the process and now with my son gone um we're this tight knit uh partnership that friendship that is just extremely it's strong as oak I, I love it and we're just we're having a great time with it when you talk about your son i know one of the things you said is is how proud you are of the man he's become and he's become more than what you'd hoped for and just obviously you know showering your your pride into into what he's done and, and his evolution you mentioned he's a bolt of energy and he, he's a beacon of light to everyone he comes across how much of that is a reflection on you? And you take credit hmm. for, for that and, and how far along he's come. That's well, he definitely, you know, he definitely has traits from both my wife and me. I mean, I, I'm, I'm much more of a low key, um, easygoing personality. Um, I get along with pretty much everybody. People ask, you get asked a question like, what's your superpower? And I've always felt like my superpower is I can get along with pretty much anybody. And, uh, I, I just have a, a knack for that. And I think he has those qualities. But then on the other side, my wife is extremely determined. She's got a fiery personality. Um, I've seen sides of my son that like, whoa, that's that's not me. That's <laughs> definitely not me. And that's my wife. And so he's a good mix of both of us. But but also in to his core, um, he is the same person now at 21 that he was at three years old. He's wow. just a, a full of love. Um, he surrounds himself with good, positive energy and people. Um, he knows to keep uh, others away that maybe don't bring a good energy into his world. And he's smart enough to, to recognize that. And so, you know, he brings friends home all the time on weekends and, you know, we cook and hang out with him and his friends. And like every time he leaves, we're like, wow, what a great friend that that person was that was here. And like he just he picks his friends very well. So we're really proud of that. Um, and his nature, he just he has an energy about him, I think, that people gravitate to. So really, really proud of that. And I think that's just who he's always been. It's nothing I think me or my wife has contributed to. He's that same person he was as a three year old now at 21. And it's a very infectious energy that he's just always had. How does he show you how much he appreciates you? And maybe it's not words, maybe it's actions. Um, he, he's not afraid to share how he feels. Um, you know, we, he always, always says thanks to me. I mean, being in the industry that I'm in, I'm able to provide him with experiences for him and his friends to go to games, go to concerts. Um, just a few weeks back, he and I, um, he, he had introduced me to an artist. Um, everybody's heard of Jack Harlow and, you know, I, I've never thought I would become a fan of someone like Jack Harlow, but because Gabe introduced me to him, I started listening and I was like, man, I really like this guy. And so he was at the forum a few weeks back and I got his tickets and he and I went to the show and we just had the best time. And we had dinner before just me and him, um, watch the show together. We both left. I dropped him in his car. He went back to school and I went home. And when I got home, I had a long text from him thanking me oh. and telling me how much he enjoyed it. And, um, you know, so I, I, he shares with us all the time, how much he cares for us and appreciates us. And that's, that's really all you can ask for. You want that reciprocation from your child. And he's a, a very affectionate and the type of person that's not afraid to sort of express how he feels. 
How do you show that care and that, that love for those who you work with and mm -hmm. how you hope to, in a way, take the way in which you ha have bonded so well with, with your immediate family and then in a way taking that to work and the way in which you uh, let people know that, that you care about them and yeah. that you appreciate them? I, 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 I appreciate you asking me that because I think that's a real core principle as a leader that I try to, I start with, um, you're the people that work with you and for you have to know that you care first. And so, um, I, I try every single day to engage with as many people as I can that either work for me or that are a part of our ecosystem here and, um, show a genuine interest in them as people. Um, and then, you know, also, but also, you know, hold people accountable and, and speak with them honestly and give them honest feedback, but you can't give them honest feedback if they don't know that you truly care about them. So I, I always try to show that I care first. Um, we just had a big division call with my, all my team yesterday. And normally that calls about an hour and we go through all departments and, and goals and priorities. And, and I was like, you know, I, I talked about a few successes that we had as a group over the last couple of weeks. And then we spent the rest of the meeting. I went one by one through 30 different employees. I wanted to know what each of them was doing for Thanksgiving wow. and something that they were thank that they were thankful for. And so it was great. We laughed. We had a it was just it was normally a, a you know a formal call and meeting that we have on a monthly basis. And this time it was just very informal. Let's just hear from everybody. What are you doing? What are you looking forward to? And what are you thankful for? So um, again, I, I really make it a priority to try to show first and foremost that I care. A way because I should... do actually because I do like that's yeah. the thing. It's 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 authentic. I do care. Uh, sometimes I care too much, and I think that contributes to some of the stress and some of the anxiety and some of the sleepless sleepless nights I'll have because I care too much. And so that's something I work on with myself because sometimes that obsession with wanting things to be right, wanting things to be good for everyone uh, ends up hurting me in the end. But uh, that's just something I'm working on with me. Yeah. How do you, how do you find your, yourself through that? Because obviously that in a way, Mike, a lot of us, you know, those, especially who are empath, empathic people, we, we take on others, you know, things because we want to help them and we feel their struggles that we want to be there for them and help them along the way. But then you have your life too, while also acknowledging what they're going through. So how has that process been like for you and sort of sifting through that dynamic? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a, been a very big challenge for me. Um, I think just because of who I am as a person, if someone is having, um, a challenge in their life and that's impacting their work. Um, and then I have a conversation with them about it to try to help them. A lot of times I end up taking that burden from them and then I carry it and that's not healthy and I can't do that. And, um, that's one thing I realized, like you, you can, you can listen, you can provide guidance and you can, do what you can to help people, but you can't carry their burden for them. And so um, I I used to do that quite a bit with everyone and it just became a huge weight for me. And I've slowly been learning to, you have to just not carry that load. My, my mom told me, it was a great line. She said, when people walk in your office to talk to you, if you're a boss, they're usually walking in with a monkey on their back, so to speak. And the, and the goal yeah. is you have to make sure they walk out of the office and take the monkey with them. <laughs> yeah, they'll dump it on and you. A lot of times they come in to vent or they want to complain about something. And then if I take the monkey from them, now I've taken that burden and I carry it. And that's what I can't do. Who listens to you when you want to, to vent? We all vent in a healthy way. Mm. But those... How powerful do you find it when when your needs are heard? You, obviously, everybody is coming to you all the time as a boss, and, yeah. and they have needs. And as you just mentioned, but the the fulfillment, the the comfort that you get when people listen to you and, mm -hmm. and what's going on with you and how that makes you feel. That's a great question. I think that having the ability to to vent and to share burdens and challenges with other people that you trust is extremely important to your well-being. Um, there have been times for me um, 
you know, I've been carrying challenges and stress and, um, but, you know, I'll get home, you know, my wife senses it, maybe we just don't have time to talk. And then all of a sudden, like a couple of days later, you know, she'll, her and I'll get in a, a good two hour conversation and I'll just lay it all out there for her. And that is such a refreshing uh, a breath, a breath of fresh air for me to be able to do that. And there's people here at work that, that I trust and that I can sit down because a lot of times I'm the venting source for them. <laughs> yeah. And so I try not to, I'm not big on venting too much. I kind of hold things in, but there's times where you need it. And I think it's uh, an extremely valuable resource to have people that you can trust, that you can confide in, but also just lay it all out there and and not expect solutions, but just someone who can receive it and and uh, let you know, hey, things are going to be fine. And that's really all you need, ultimately. When you look over your career in working with the Kings, what are you okay holding on to through this process? Um, I, I feel like I have a certain level of responsibility um, that is just comes with the territory for me. And so um, I do carry a lot. And, you know, I, I think I've been able to shoulder a lot over the years in my various roles. Um, I've always tried to be a positive resource for others. And I've always um, functioned in roles where um, I don't necessarily need to get credit for anything. I just want to contribute. And in contributing, a lot of times that is carrying uh, burdens for others and helping people find solutions. And ultimately, I feel like on a day to day basis, my job is to help find solutions. Um, and those solutions are usually for other people. So, um, you know, I, I carry that sort of challenge on me every single day. And I'm okay with that, because I, I believe truly that is the best way to lead is to be a resource for solutions for others. Because ultimately, other people's success means I'm successful. And so if I can help other people be successful and, and do well in their jobs and in their role and, and grow, um, that's going to make me successful ultimately. So it's a selfish way of helping others, but it's the truth. Like you have to be able to to carry that and and to, to help people get to the next level. And ultimately that, that will benefit you. With that said, Mike, when do you allow yourself to accept that self-recognition you're first to give it out to others and deflect mm -hmm. as that selfless leader that you are but when do you allow yourself to then say i did a good job mm -hmm. and obviously you're always doing a good job but yeah. when do you could because that's so hard when do you get to that point where you're able to say as a team we did a great job obviously mm -hmm. but then you give yourself the credit that you deserve internally. Yeah, I think it I think it only happens with with me by myself. Um when I really sit and reflect. I spend a lot of time with myself. I always <laughs> one of the things that I've always told my son, um he's like, "Dad, what are you doing this weekend?" like or you know, "What are you doing here? What are you doing there?" And I said, "Oh, I'm I'm going to spend some time with my favorite person myself." <laughs> so I've told him that for years and years and now he uses that line too because in the end you have to love who you are and you have to love yourself and so um the, whenever those moments happen it's usually me in my own space and I'm you know talking to myself that voice we all have inside of our head that's that's the relationship I have with me and I've learned to use that relationship as a tool and as a, a means to empower myself and give myself confidence. And if I wake up and I'm not in a good space, I, I tell myself, like, it, all I got to do is change my mindset. And that, that muscle and that ability to change my mindset puts me in a good place. And so when it's time for me to sit and reflect and could be somewhere having a coffee by myself or looking at the ocean or just being at home by myself, I I, I definitely do take the time to recognize when I have done good work and feel good about it, but it's usually always only me when that's happening. When you sit and reflect, how often do you, when you, when you go back and, and think about what you've done, go back to, to the young version of Mike Altieri, who was working for the Lakers and saw that the King's office was down the hall, loved hockey, wanted to meet people in that organization as a lifelong somebody who was born as a child and a Kings fan to then go into that office and walk in there 
and, and build those relationships. And then all these years later to see where you are now. Yeah, I'm, I, I'll be honest. I'm really proud of it. Um, I, I had the opportunity to, to work with the Lakers and John Black and Jeannie Buss and Tim Harris, three of my uh, true mentors early on in my career. And they, they knew how much I loved the Kings and loved hockey. And so when the opportunity came for me to take an entry level job there back in 1995, they couldn't have been more supportive and encouraging for me. And um, I walked in the door and, and to me, that was like, I was so thrilled to be there. I mean, I had been three years working for the Lakers. That couldn't be much better than there's nothing much better than that. But, um, when I got that opportunity with the Kings and, and working for John Black for so long, uh, I watched him do his job with the Lakers. And I'm like, I want that opportunity with the Kings. I want to do what John does with the Kings. And I got that opportunity and, I was able to move slowly into that role, ultimately becoming director of communications and being that day-to-day -day person, um, watching John do that for the Lakers. He was the eye of the hurricane for them. He dealt with everybody. He dealt with the players, coaches, management, the fans, celebrities, the media. Like he was in the middle of all of it. And I wanted that. And I was able to get there with the Kings and then have that experience and then go through some amazing uh, playoff runs and championships in that role that you're just so close to all of it. It was a dream come true. When you got to touch and hold that Stanley cup, how was that a dream come true? Um, honestly, it was, uh, again, being such a fan of sports and live sports and the unpredictability of it. And then being with the Kings for 17 years and never even getting close to it. Um, I was just overwhelmed with what the achievement required for those athletes, for those players. Um, in the role that I was in, I couldn't be any closer to it and without being actually on the ice playing. I, so I was right there watching it and to watch what these individuals went through from a physical and mental standpoint, uh, to, to go four rounds of just physical, abusive hockey. I can't even put it into words, but like, and then to ultimately win it, um, it was, I was just thrilled to be there. It wasn't that I had won the cup. I didn't even look at it that way. I just, I was so thrilled that I got to be alongside of it. Um, and, you know, yeah, to grab the cup and hold the cup is an amazing feeling, especially in that moment. Um, but really it was more about the admiration for the players that had won it and being so close to see and watched what they went through to get that achievement was amazing. Um, one of the other fun things was the ability, you know, the, the after, when you win it, you have the cup for a period of months. And so my team and my job was to manage the cup and where it went. And so we just got, we got to spend a lot of time with the Stanley cup. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun for sure. One of those moments that you had the cup, you took it to your son's school. And now you're having, now as we first started out this conversation with, you talk about the love of your family and the love of your of your work at the Stanley Cup. To mm -hmm. intertwine that love and have your son see that and then mm -hmm. show it off at his school and to have that, which as you said, all of those years working with the, the organization, anybody that works with the organization, you never know when that moment's going to come. It could be unimaginable. And then the dream came and it came again with another Stanley Cup a couple of years later. But what were you like in that headspace when you got to have what you love from a job perspective with your son together and being mm -hmm. able to show that off? It was overwhelming for me. I think that you just have no idea how impactful that trophy can be for people. Um, and then when you win it, and then it's like you own it for this period of time. And so as an organization, we were just trying to share the cup with as many entities and people and organizations and, and groups and, and individuals throughout the period that we had it. And that whole experience, watching people react to it, and uh, it's, it's overwhelming, to be honest with you. And then managing the schedule, you know, every, every day we knew where the cup was going to be, where it was going. And, and there was a gap 
one day where I was like, I could, I could use it for two hours and take it to my son's school. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to reward myself here. I'm going to do this. So I went and took it and uh, it was awesome. And I could just see how proud my son was to, to have that there. And even, even for him, um, you know, he was at a very young age too. I don't think he really truly understood the magnitude of it until maybe a few years later. Um, when people ask me what was the best part about winning two Stanley Cups, I always say my son was eight and 10. Uh, I mean, sorry, he was 10 and 12. And uh, because those were his ages when we won. And I think to be a 10 year old and a 12 year old and go through that and be as close to it as he got to be, it was just uh, a very impressionable time for a young boy like him. And that's a very incredible experience to have as a 10 and 12 year old. And you've been able to share so many of those moments with you. And, and as you talked about how proud you are of him and, and what he's become, as you said, a, a bolt of energy and a beacon and, uh, of light and, and somebody who has a lot of your qualities, but there are some qualities that you pointed out that, that you like, yeah. you're like, okay, that's more of my wife. And, yeah. and yeah. obviously as we wrap up this conversation, Mike, congrats to to you and your wife for, for that partnership and that, that strong bond that you have. And it, I it's appreciate inspirational it. to, to, to all of us to hear how, you know, she understood your commitments and she was able to sacrifice for you. You've sacrificed so much for the Kings and for your family. And so in all of these different worlds you live in, I wanted to be able to kind of bring them all together and show people who Mike Altieri is from a dad, a husband, and somebody who is dominating with the LA Kings. Mike Altieri, obviously, you know him, Senior Vice President, Marketing Communications. I'm Brian Fenley, Tennis Channel and Fox Sports Radio. Mike, thanks for doing this. This was a lot of fun getting to really dig deep into your life. I appreciate it, Brian. It means a lot. Um, you know, it's uh, you, you go through so much in life and in your career and just to have opportunities like this to just take a few minutes and reflect on it is is valuable. It means a lot. So I, I thank you for that.